So it's an exact theory, and the very nice thing is that you can check all the approximations you make when you implement this and, and make sure you, you do it right. And you can also do further simplifications, and then this theory boils down to normal, uh, non conserving super potential uh, theory or also soft super potential theory. So it's all contained in this uh, very nice theory. Yeah. yeah. This, you, you have this paper, yeah. the PAW method. This was actually on Nicola's list of most cited papers that he had. If you remember that. This paper by Peter Pippen. Yeah. yeah. That would be another of those papers later, I think. Yeah, so this is how it works. Uh, you said we uh, work with smooth uh, wave functions, super wave functions, and then we have a transformation operator that maps them onto the space of all the electron wave functions. So these are the ones that are easy to expand in our computational cell, like in brain waves, or in maybe want to have a real space grid with grid points or something. So that's easy to describe, and this is the real one with all the oscillations and uh, cusps and everything. So those are, uh, so we, we again choose to describe some uh, latent states and then we describe the other core states as frozen. So, so then you have to separate at some point these are frozen and these we want to describe uh, in our calculation. But the real ones, they have to be orthogonal to all the frozen core states. And this is, uh, this is fulfilled here. And the transformation looks like this. So for every atom, you have a number of, uh, uh, these are called uh, all electron partial waves, these are super partial waves, and these are projector functions. And these projector functions are, are a bit like the, these uh, functions we saw earlier in this. These are exactly similar to these. Um, so they uh, we have such a set of uh, functions here. And uh, so if we have a, to operate with this, transformation on a super wave function, this will then pick up a part of it and then it will do this correction here. Subtract the super part and add the correct one. Um, and uh, these super wave functions, they are of course chosen to be, no, sorry, these all electron partial waves, they are solutions to, to an isolated atom. And then we construct these other ones so that they are identical to the real wave functions outside some cutoff region. And then we have this uh, relation here that inside these spheres we have uh, this expansion here uh, and this, uh, this equation here holds only if we have an infinite number of these projector functions and partial waves. But in practice uh, this just needs to work. Uh, it's true for, for the actual super wave function that we encounter in our molecule. So we don't really need that many. And then this transformation has, if you plug in this, uh, this all to these uh, super partial waves, you will see that it actually maps on to the all the partial waves. Okay, so what do, do these functions look like? Uh, this is uh, um, uh, atom. Well, you can see, uh, for example, the 6S state. It has, that has the, this black curve here. So we choose a color radius here. And then we you can see the black one it has these uh, many, many oscillations. Then we construct this, this dashed one here, which is our super wave function. And then there's a corresponding projector function here. And then for this atom, we can have, uh, if you just have the, these states here, these are the remaining states, and then we choose some extra projector functions to have more flexibility. And this seems to be enough to get a good description of that. Uh, another interesting thing here is the green curve here, which is this uh, D orbital. You can see it has this uh, peak here. 
And if you sort of try to, in your head, uh, take the dash curve, you square that and integrate it, you can see that it contains uh, the, the pseudo wave function doesn't contain all the electrons. So that's, uh, we don't have to have this normal conservation uh, constraint. And that allows us to choose this pseudo wave function uh, much more smoothly. So this is, uh, now we're going back to the, no, this is still the maximum 6s orbital. Now you can really see the oscillations here. So the, the dashed blue line, that is the one we really want to describe. But let's say we want to use a coarse grid with these uh, dots here. So there's just no way we can capture all these features here with this coarse grid. But we can describe the the pseudo part of this wave function here. And then inside the, this color range here, in this sphere here, we have corrections. That's these, uh, we have this uh, A here that makes it a uh, function centered on the atom. So these are described by, by, by just uh, radial functions. So they will have a, a, a very fine uh, sampling here and then also also as we go out here. So the final expression for the real one we want to look at is this, well, this thing here that we can easily expand in some brain waves, for example, and then we have corrections for each atom. So we can take this, this one and, and put it in our energy expression and then see what we get. So here's a, a, an example for a completely general operator O. And this could, for example, be the kinetic energy you would want to evaluate that. Um, so if we put in the expansion we, we, that we have, uh, this is the real wave function, it's the pseudo wave function plus, plus these corrections here, then uh, uh, you can see that there's this term here where you just get the, the operator and the pseudo wave function, then some corrections here. They look quite nasty, but uh, fortunately, this guy here is uh, only not zero inside the atomic compensation sphere. So, uh, different sides do not mix, so we can drop the, the B here, so B. And uh, furthermore, you can expand this wave function here in one center. Uh, there's a one center expansion of, of these uh, super wave functions that you can insert here. Because again, this thing is only uh, relevant inside the sphere of atom A. And if you do the math, uh, uh, it's very simple to here. So, just use the pseudo wave functions instead of the real one, and then there are some corrections. And these, if you're lucky, you can calculate these corrections uh, once and for all. So now, uh, that's the same expression here. That's on the last slide. And then, for example, if we wanted to have the kinetic energy, we would uh, put in the kinetic energy operator and we would sum over all states with some multiplication numbers. And then it makes sense to do the sum over n point. And that's, we can put that into something called D, and that is an atomic density matrix. And then it becomes very, very simple. So let's put in the kinetic energy operator. Um, so you get this, uh, you know the expression here, so you can just put in the, the pseudo wave functions instead, like here, and then there are corrections here, that look like this. And then you should remember the kinetic energy call states also. And these density matrices, they can be used to expand the, the density inside the, the, the spheres in general. And here you can also uh, add the, you should also remember the core density, and there's a smooth version of that. So if you want the density, that's also something we need for the energy expression. You just take the pseudo density, add some corrections again. And uh, one more time, if you put in the 
exchange of correlation functional, we get just just evaluate the thing on the superdensity and the fraction here. And uh, it's very, very nice that uh, this actually uh, gives the correct energy. You may have heard of something that is called a nonlinear core correction. That's something you have from superdensity theory, where you just have this term here. But then you add something, a little bit of the, something that looks like the core density to this density here uh, to get a better description, but in this PAW theory, it's really done correctly. It's exactly correct. This is only for single local functions, so MGA and GGA. Um, and this integral here, you have to do that inside the sphere, and, and you really have to, you not just do a radial integration, you need to integrate inside the whole sphere because these are not necessarily spherical <coughs> symmetry, but it's uh, quite fast to do. And then finally, the uh, Coulomb energy, and I will not go through this uh, in all details, uh, and look at the slides and try to uh, follow it yourself. Yes. Really a lot of formulas. Uh, but in the end, it's kind of look uh, exactly like the other equations that uh, uh, you have something here that uh, is just evaluated. It's just a normal expression where you put in the, the charge density, but you just use the pseudo charge density instead. And some corrections again. And this interval is actually uh, in the G4 code done by solving a Poisson equation and then you can uh, evaluate it like this so that's a, a nice trick instead of doing this six dimensional integral you can solve this equation here and then do this uh, three dimensional integral alternatively you can also do it uh, by Fourier transforming this uh, charge density and then there's a, a very direct, a direct expression <coughs> So to summarize, um, you have these uh, three terms here, which you just evaluate on your pseudo density and pseudo wave functions, and some corrections. And these corrections depend only on these uh, atomic density matrices. So now we can define a, a Hamiltonian uh, like this, you take the derivative of the energy with respect to the wave functions, and that, that then looks like this, which is uh, which again looks very much like our Kleinman Kleinman and Rylander uh, form that we looked at earlier. That you have a kinetic energy and a pseudo potential and some uh, non local projections. Um, I think the thing to notice here is that this uh, delta H will, uh, it's not a constant matrix. Uh, maybe I forgot to say that. The number here, these eyes, they, they have to be something like 10 projector functions, so it's a 10 by 10 matrix perhaps, depending on which atom you're looking at. So this is actually, it adapts to the environment, whereas in the normal pseudo potential, this is a, a constant. So uh, that's one simplification you do here. You can just evaluate this for an atom and then put it in your bound function, and that's really uh, normal pseudo
And then we have a final number of these projectors and partial waves. Here you can also add more. And uh, these uh, spheres around each atom are not supposed to overlap, but it's not like everything is explodes. When they touch each other, it will sort of just slowly break down the approximations. So in practice, they, they overlap a little bit, and that's fine. And then, of course, the, the, the standard uh, DBT approximations that I'm going to talk about. So now I would like to run a little bit of small calculation. So, when you do these exercises, you will import stuff from this AAC. So let's make an H2 molecule. So now we uh, can look at the positions. So they are right on top of each other. So we can close set those. <coughs> Uh, 
of numbers, so that's a very efficient way to treat the numbers in Python. And uh, that's what we use for positions and weight functions and everything. And then, of course, there are some libraries for what we want to number crunching. For example, there's this DPEG-C where we get all the different functions from. And it's, uh, it's uh, free software, so it's uh, core free and free as and free them. So you can grab it and do with it what you want. Uh, so let's talk about the final difference mode, which is where you have the uh, uh, wave functions described on a regular uniform grid. So it's very, very simple. Uh, just choose your unit cell, these uh, lattice vectors, and how many wave functions you want. And then we need uh, to use uh, a final difference approximation for this uh, operator here that we need for the Cauchyan equation and the Poisson equation. And here, Illustrated just for one dimension because we can generalize that to any uh, unit cell we want. And uh, <coughs> this uh, has some very uh, nice advantages uh, that you can, for example, if you, this is your unit cell, you can split it in, uh, in different domains and then get each, uh, each of your computers uh, one domain and then one CPU can work on this and another one can work on this. So it's, uh, it's done in parallel. But uh, this uh, illustrates sort of the final difference stencil that if you need the passion here, you need to know the neighboring uh, grid point value. So if you are close to the boundary, you will need to communicate a little bit with the neighbor CPU. And also if you are projector function, sort of crossing a boundary, then uh, this integral of the projector function and the wave function, which all over the cell uh, that will be split in two and they need to communicate about what is the sum of this, uh, this uh, interval. But it's only across the boundaries that you need to uh, communicate. The disadvantage with this uh, technique, this technique is that uh, you need quite a lot of grid points. So if you're not studying a very big system, it's, it's not the best way. But if you are studying in very big systems, it's really fantastic and we can go crazy and scale up to many, many goals if your system is big enough and people have actually done that. Uh, but don't do this uh, in the exercises. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's uh, 0, 0.0 almost. Uh, and uh, for some of the exercises, you will, uh, it, it, the code manager will complain if you, if you ask for not too many. So then just to make sure they should be quite fast the exercises. Uh, next, uh, next way to describe the wave functions is to expand them in uh, multiple uh, basis functions centered on, on each uh, set of atoms. Um, so here you would typically uh, have some, some basis functions that are almost like the valence states. Uh, but they are in a calculated time potential so that they actually go to zero at some radius of the having a very low exponential chain. And then on top of this minimum basis set that you add extra uh, functions to for flexibility. Um, but it's really underneath it's exactly the same approximation as with the final difference code. It's just a different way of describing the wave functions. So these needs to expand the super wave function, so it's, it's the same problem to solve. And the advantage is that you can do very uh, large systems because you will have very few uh, basis functions for each atom, so it's a very small, much smaller problem to solve. And you can pre-compute a lot of the integrals that you need, so that uh, once you run the calculation, these can be evaluated fast. And this also allows you to do quick and dirty calculations if you just want to relax some molecule quickly and see what happens. You can do that and you can switch to a more accurate description later. Uh, disadvantage, of course, is that it's very hard to reach the complete basis of limit if you really want to have the correct energy. If you're not just looking at energy differences, for example. 
So these basic sets are of course good at describing atoms, but not necessarily very good at describing points between atoms, and that's really what's important. So it's a, the, these basic sets are tricky to converge. <coughs> the next basic set is completely general, it doesn't know anything about atoms, so it's good at describing anything. And uh, it's also very simple. So this is a plane wave, and that's coefficient, and then you just include plane waves with uh, up to some uh, wave weight term. And typically, we choose this as an energy, a cutoff energy, so that the kinetic energy of this plane wave should be less than, say, 300 EV, for example. And that's very easy to convert, it just increases the number. Converged at some point. And this is really uh, uh, the expression of the Fourier transform from reciprocal space to real space. And there are something called fast Fourier transform algorithms on computers that do this very, very efficiently. And many of the other operations uh, can be formulated in a way where it's written as matrix matrix multiplications, and those are also very efficient on a computer. So this is really a hard to beat method if you have a small system and, and you can also go larger but uh, really large then you may want to use LCO or final methods uh, if you want to parallelize the game So there are some disadvantages of course that uh, uh, the boundary conditions must, must match your basis functions and, and they are periodic so it's forced to have periodic boundary conditions. And your basis functions are everywhere. It's just it's not like in CAO where you have basis functions in different regions, so you can divide space uh, up and, and give different parts to different uh, computers. Um, so this was the equation we need to solve. So if we have a basis set, uh, for example, plane waves, we could just uh, set up a matrix of H and S in our basis set, so that would be easy, uh, but the problem is that you would have easily uh, 10,000 of plane wave coefficients, and then this matrix, this, this H and S, S matrix would be 10,000 by 10,000, so you would never be able to calculate it or store it, and you only need a few uh, the those eigenvalues, so that's not the way to go. Instead, we do something called iterative diagonalization. Uh, or actually, I should say that uh, for LCAO, you have so few basis functions. So here it's actually possible to make these matrices and just use uh, brute force uh, uh, in your algebra methods to diagonalize and, and find the states and eigenvalues. But for final techniques and plane waves, it's not possible. So instead, we uh, make a good initial guess for the wave functions. Uh, we typically do <coughs> a very small basis set of LCAO. Um, and then you, uh, these are the steps you have to follow. You have to make sure they are orthogonal, and then you can calculate the density. And when you have the density, we can calculate the potential. And when you have the potential, you have to everything that enters this. And it's only so you can apply the and so to the, the current wave functions. And then you can, then there's an additional step here that's called subspace diagonalization. That is where you find the best linear combination of the current wave functions, and that's uh, uh, that speeds up convergence uh, from its systems. And then you can calculate the, the error here, the error makes A is psi minus epsilon psi. This is sort of what you want to be zero. And then you can use this error to improve the, the wave function. Um, and then you have new wave functions and you go back to the SN. Then the second time you do, you have to mix a little bit of the new density with the old one so that it, this update is stable and it doesn't explode. So this mixing and updating the wave function, that's really quite complicated. Uh, this paper, I think, was on the, on the list also as one of the most cited, and it's very, very good. You should read this. And uh, 
Is this website which techniques to use here for whole wave basis sets? And you can use the same for finite difference uh, implementation. It's just uh, it's very similar, but the same tricks can be used. Okay, let's look at the, where the time uh, is spent when we do a calculation. <coughs> so let's say you have uh, 100 atoms, this many electrons, and this many uh, brain waves or trip points. Then some parts of the calculation will scale linearly, and those are the ones that you see as bottleneck for small systems, but once you do 100 electrons or something, you will not worry about these. And those are something like uh, solving the Poisson equation, which scales linearly with the number of grid points. And if you do it the plane way, way it uh, can be done with fast Fourier transforms. Uh, but here, this is just the uh, scaling that also prefactors. And solving the Poisson equation is an iterative procedure, so it has a large prefactor. Whereas this has a very, very uh, small prefactor, because it's just one uh, T beta. So it's not necessarily much slower than this thing. Um, then there are other parts that are taken in exchange of correlation in. It's also linear and not something you worry about too much about. So then uh, these are the ones you typically see uh, as uh, the bottleneck of the calculation. And that's something like calculating this. <coughs> projections here, that actually is the last part of it. In uh, real space, uh, with this final difference method, we just had to, for every atom and every electron, you have to sum all the grid points inside the spheres. And that number is a fixed number, so it escapes stupidly. The way uh, key points are implemented this for the frame wave version is uh, doing it in reciprocal space, so there you have sum of all of your brain waves because they are not localized so you have to include all of them they, they will all enter your sphere for, for this particular atom so it scales like this but again it's very small prefactor here so uh, most code, uh, codes do, do it like this for small systems and some code they do it in real space when you go to very large systems to avoid this cubic scaling then they can do it like this so this should not be here, but never mind. Uh, and then the other cubically, quadratically scaling terms like the kinetic energy of the V times psi, where the, the scaling is like this, and again it's, this, this can be done with the FFT, so it's quite fast. Um, Cubic terms, those are really uh, nasty for that, that, that's what kills you, that's what prevents us from doing uh, thousands of atoms, and then it becomes just annoying to be DFT with these uh, methods. And that's something like uh, uh, calculating this uh, S matrix when you orthogonalize your or break box you have to see, uh, calculate the overlap of all your states with all the other states. And uh, that's the NE square, and then sum of all the different points of the waves. Uh, again, low prefactor, easy to parallelize, so it's not too bad. And this is a similar term just for the H matrix. And then the result of this is these two matrices that you then have to do for linear algebra, and that's uh, that scales cubically with the number of connections, and that's really hard to, to parallelize. You cannot easily uh, split that calculation in over different uh, CPUs. Uh, but you will not see these terms in your calculations, the exercises, at least. Okay, so uh, for these uh, calculations, you need uh, what we call setups or data sets. For populate or complete, so a description for each atom where you have decided which are the core states and, and what should, how many projector functions should you have and what, how do we choose this pseudo core entity and so on. So we have done this for you and 
provided uh, these, uh, there's a file for each uh, element, and uh, so you can just use them, but it's really up to you to test them if you do them for real stuff for your research. You should not just think that they are okay. You should uh, do test calculations and compare with uh, uh, other methods where you uh, trust the results. And uh, there's this uh, little program called Gfold dash setup that you can use uh, if you want to generate the data set for Silica. You should get the same as the one you distribute in Go. But if you want we uh, if you want it for, for a lot of functions, then you can just run this thing and you get from your favorite function. And you can also play with the parameters, change the radius or change the number of projects and so So you should just know that uh, this, these are approximations that uh, you need to test. <coughs> so in, uh, during the exercises, the, there will be uh, many things to choose from. The first one here, the, these up here, those are mainly uh, something you, when you calculate the ground state of your system and then you do something with this uh, wave functions or whatever or maybe the energy, you can calculate the energy barriers with this notch elastic band method or do an STM image that we use wave functions and so on. And that's all fine, but then there's the, the three other uh, exercises where you uh, do some post DT stuff where you calculate the density response function from your whole sham states, and here you uh, it's not just the ground state that's important, you need all the states. And, uh, so uh, there are two things to worry about here. One is how to get all those uh, uh, empty states, and the other one is are the uh, data sets good enough for this, so we can test these things if you use this for real work. And how do you get those uh, empty states that you need? You could just solve the, use this iterative solver and, and just ask for many, many bands, but they're not very good at that. So instead, uh, in the exercise, we will do what I said you could not do. Uh, you cannot normally not set up the whole Hamiltonian matrix in your complete uh, basis set of green waves, it would be too big, but for, the, for small systems, you can actually do that, and that's the most efficient way get a lot of eigenvalues. So that's, uh, that's in the code looks something like this. You read in your, your restart file from the ground state and then you call this method here that calculates the full and control and then diagonalize it. And it's blue false and then you write a new file with all the wave functions that you can then use for the spectrum and stuff. So um, we have installed the code for you, so everything is there, but maybe it's good to know a little bit about how this works. So there's one environment variable here that is going to a folder where all these files are. So there's that's the PW data sets, so there's one for hydrogen and then LDA and then it's compressed, it's really just a compressed text file. So you can look inside if you want. And there's one for even and so on, and there are also other functionals here. So those have also those, those have been done for you. And then uh, there's you need this AC code, so, so this path here needs to point to uh, where, where this code is and the GPO code, and there's also this uh, shared object that uh, the Python terms of will read and uh, so that's where the C code is. Unless you're running in parallel, then you will be using a special Python interpreter called GPO Python, which has NPI built in for <coughs> communicating uh, between processes. And uh, then I just want to uh, point out that you can read much more about this on these web pages. And as Carsten mentioned, it's really the work of uh, a lot of people. A lot of people have contributed with exercises and documentation and code and testing and so on. 
And uh, there's a mailing list if you're really, really interested. And uh, we also meet sometimes on IRC. And uh, I hope we have yeah, we have plenty of time for questions. So go ahead. It looks exactly the same. You just don't have all the wiggles inside, but you don't care about that. Okay, what you obtain, well, you can do this at a particular energy of the incoming electron. What you gain with the normal conservation is that if you do this at a particular energy, then it's also correct in a small window around that energy. 
That's the derivative that you should always talk about. That you get the right derivative with respect to the energy. So in that way, instead of doing it right just at a certain energy, you sort of get a whole range. And that's that's why people like the law of conservation. And you will uh, lose some of that if you if you break this. On the other hand, you have the possibility of having more projectors and so on, and in this way you can still describe a, a, a wide energy range where you have the right spectrum. Thank you. Yeah, I think that the law of conservation is coming back because uh, it was something you did because you want you now the computers are faster, you can afford to in many cases to have no conservation of more brain waves. So it might be coming back someday. There's actually Geo Kaiser who's coming tomorrow and giving talks here as a new paper where he's suggesting that these PAW setups should also be non conservative because that would increase the accuracy in some in some regions. Yeah. How big is the spring space and the real space and do you usually extend that size or do you change it by every kind of system? Uh, if the default value is 0.2 ounce by and that sort of works for most uh, elements, I think that's something you have to check.